Right, so we have <laughs> looked briefly at the uh, definitions for most of the factors of dependent origination, and we just got the, the, the last two, which are of course the first two, which are Sankara and Avija. So Sankara, uh, those of you who, who were here yesterday, <coughs> we had some discussion about this at the time, but the basic idea of Sankara is that Sankara is some kind of force or energy or action that creates some kind of result. All right, This is the basic fundamental idea that's underlying it. And it's used in many different kinds of ways. For example, one, one context that it's used in is the context of building work. Right, So you construct something through some building work or something like that. In this context, obviously, it doesn't mean building work. It doesn't mean uh, ritual, which is another one of the meanings for it. It doesn't mean, in some cases, it means something like, say, uh, everything which is conditioned, right? Everything that's part of the, the world of conditions that we inhabit can be considered to be a sankhara. Right? So Buddhism is a philosophy of energies, not a philosophy of entities. Right? So the world, the, world, the world is made up of energies that are interacting all the time. So Sankara has that kind of meaning. But in this kind of context, Sankara usually has a rather more specific meaning where it has something to do with the forces in your mind that create or build up the world. Right? And so I've translated it here as choices. And of course this is, this is uh, quite an innovative translation. Most people uh, translate it as something like mental fabrications or concoctions or formations, or activities, or... Volitions. Thank you. What was that one? Volitions. Pollutions. Volitions. Volitions, yeah, mental volitions, right. Volitional formations, I think Bhikkhu Bodhi now uses. <coughs> Any other ones? Or volitional activities? <coughs> Sorry? Will. Will is not a bad one, except see here there's three of them, so you don't really have three wills, do you, right? It's not really a countable name. But something like that, yes? Conception, yeah. Intentions. Sorry? Intentions. Intentions, yep. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's a problem of disambiguation because we usually use chetana for intention. So that's taken. Bummer. Sometimes you can reuse them, but here you've got it in the same list. I mean, you can never be perfect with these things, but yes, it's something like that. And that, so it's sometimes explained in that kind of way. Abhisankaroti, abhisanchetayati. These are synonyms to, to make a, a choice or to make an intention about something. Uh, so I chose the word choices. It's not particularly good, but it's the best of a bad lot. If you can think of anything better, I'd be happy to hear from it. But I've been... My basic idea, the reason why I chose choices was because I wanted to choose a simple word that would somehow convey something important about the content, content, that you could read it and get something of the idea of what it's talking about, right? So something about what it's talking about is the idea that because avidja is ignorance, right? And because we're stupid, we make choices about things and we make dumb choices and that creates consequences for us, which is a thing and that's the basic idea, right? If you say something like mental formations or something, it's like you're so abstracted from the basic idea that it's hard to get your head around it. So I don't, I don't think of this as being like a philosophically precise and complete translation, but as like just some way of getting, conveying that basic idea to you know, a bunch of ignorant people. Yeah? <laughs> it's my pleasure, it's my pleasure, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Right. Choices and ignorance. Ignorance about suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. So this is the ignorance. Important thing about this is that um, it's not like a general definition of not knowing stuff, but specifically about not knowing these spiritual realities, right? The, 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 the way that the world works and the way that we create our suffering according to the Four Noble Truths, this is the fundamental ignorance which is driving that whole process of dependent origination. All right? So that was relatively straightforward. So now we've done all the 12 factors of dependent origination. Yay, everybody, give yourself a hand. Fantastic.
That's excellent. Easy, right? Yeah, that's what Ananda said. Buddha said, you think this is easy? <laughs> you wait. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay. Now, ignorance is interesting, right? Not knowing. Let me read to you briefly a uh, one of my favorite texts from the Rig Veda. Nasadiya Sukta. So this is from the 10th uh, book of the Rig Veda. Rig Veda was compiled quite a long time before the Buddha. I mean, it was compiled over a long period of time, but this particular verse maybe a few hundred years before the Buddha or so. <coughs> then even nothing... So this is one of the Vedic texts. Just so you're clear, it's not a Buddhist text, it's a Vedic text, but it has an interesting connection. There, then even nothingness was not nor existence. There was no air then, nor the heavens beyond it. What covered it? Where was it? In whose keeping? Was there then cosmic water in depths unfathomed? Then there was neither death nor immortality. Nor was there then the torch of night and day, the one breathed windlessly and self-sustaining. There was that one then, and there was no other. At first there was only darkness wrapped in darkness. All this was only unillumined cosmic water. That one which came to be enclosed in nothing arose at last born of the power of heat. Tapas. In the beginning desire depended upon it. Karma. That was the primal seed born of the mind. The sages who have searched their minds with wisdom know that which is, is kin to that which is not. And they have stretched their cord across the void and know what was above and what was below. So this idea is like setting, laying, a, laying a measuring line. right? So this forms, everything is formless and now we've drawn a line across the void. Seminal powers made fertile mighty forces. Below was strength and over it was impulse. But after all, who knows and who can say whence, all it, whence it all came and how creation happened? The gods themselves are later than creation. So who knows truly whence it has arisen? Whence all creation had its origin, the Creator, whether He fashioned it or whether He did not, the Creator who surveys it all from highest heaven, He knows. Or maybe even He does not know. <laughs> so, Anga Veda, Yariva Naveda. Right? And it's such an incredible piece of writing and such an incredible piece of philosophy and everything and remember this is the Vedas right the word Veda means knowledge right and the last word of this you see what it says yadi <laughs> Veda yadi not Veda <laughs> maybe we don't know actually <laughs> yeah? maybe this is knowledge maybe this is not knowledge and you can see what what, a, what to me what a beautiful spirit infuses this that whole text that spirit of wonder Right throughout this kind of whole thing, like you know, the, the, there it was. Who covered it? Where was it? In whose keeping was there then cosmic water in depths? Some like this idea of cosmic water is really uh, universal in creation mythology. Right, the thing is just water. Everything's formless, and it's sounding in a very poetic and reflective way. It sounds a lot like the very common creation mythology, which you find across, you know. I don't know about all cultures, but certainly very widely across cultures. I already mentioned before some parallels with the, the Genesis story, but you know you can think of the Genesis story with the beginning there was nothing, just a formless void, and God, the Spirit, moved across the face of the waters. And that idea of the defining line, splitting dark from night, heaven from earth, good from bad. Yeah? 
this is critical to how all this kind of evolves. And then desire. So there's, there was a, uh, a paper which was written a number of years ago now which drew a whole lot of, um, of quite interesting connections between this particular passage and the dependent origination. I don't want to sort of go too much into the details of all of that, but I believe that one of the purposes of dependent origination, again, seeing it not as an absolute statement, but as part of a dialectic, part of a conversation, right? Part of a conversation is that in, in a, if you want to use the word, in a religion or a spiritual path or something like that, it is felt that we want some answer to like, where did we come from, right? What happened, right? What covered it? Whose keeping was all this in? Right? A beautiful way of putting that, in whose keeping? And one of the functions that dependent origination plays is to provide something of a creation story from a Buddhist point of view. Now there are other more kind of explicit creation mythologies in Buddhism, which I won't go into now, but they're also very interesting. Um, but they're kind of more... Uh, like occasional narratives or stories that the Buddha might tell. This is something which is much more central, right, in the middle of Buddhist doctrine. And that idea that things begin from ignorance, yeah, from unknowing. Yeah? Again, this is very much in the spirit of the creation mythology. It's just darkness on the waters and there's nothing, and then light appears. Yeah? Let there be light. I mean, I don't know how long much you want to take these parallels, right? But in the Christian creation myth, there's darkness, which is avijja. Sankaras, let there be light. It's like, that's what sankara is. And then light appears, which is consciousness. I mean, there's so many parallels between these kinds of storytelling and what we see in dependent origination. So uh, the Buddha is like taking some of these ideas and expressing them in a very, uh, again, a very rationalizing form. Right? He's stripping away the mythic overtones and these kinds of things and saying, well, look, what are the realities that are underlying these things? We saw that th that process at work with the idea of Nama Rupa. Right? So there's a word that has a lot maybe magical or mystical connotations, and the Buddha's giving a, like a reductive analysis, saying, actually, when you look at that, it's really just these psychological factors which are present. So perhaps what I'm suggesting is that the whole of dependent origination plays a kind of similar role. I'm not saying that's the only role that, I play, that it plays, but this is one way of looking at it, that it can f play a similar function in a, in, in, in a philosophy, in a community, that the idea of a creation myth might play in other more kind of normal <laughs> religions, right? I said before, like the Buddha has creation myths, so the Aganya sort of being the best example. And I mean, you know, the beginning of the Buddha's creation myth, the, literally the first line of it is, in, there comes a time when the world ends. <laughs> That's the first line of the creation myth. So the Buddha was not a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't think the way that we do, right? He he saw things in this kind of different way, but he drew on these kinds of ideas. And the idea that we start from this perspective, maybe even he does not know. Maybe even he does not know. And that's, that's like, that's like a, a profound and beautiful insight to acknowledge within a religious and spiritual tradition, right? To be, you know, you think about how, how, how religions mostly work, right? They work because you walk around with some book and you say, this is it, we know. I'm going to bash you on the head with it until you, know, you agree that we know the same things as we do. Right? And this is saying, well, actually, maybe not. Right? It's, it's acknowledging the limits of knowledge. Yeah? That's critical. And if you know, those of you familiar with the methods of science would know that that's critical in how science works. You have to start by saying, actually, we don't really know. Let's see if we can find out. And engaging that spirit of wonder and inquiry and investigation, right? This is where ignorance is leading us to, yeah? Unknowing. Yeah? I mean, as you were reading it, I kind of took it 
took it as a discussion of sitting out, ending with you know, who could really understand. Right. It's right. like a concept that you can't really know what you Right. It sounds a lot like it, doesn't it, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, I mean, in that whole kind of Buddhist sort of idea, it's not this, nor it is it that, and, you know, in a way, it's kind of um, uh, sort of defeating your kind of attempts at rationalizing it, right? Does it begin, the world must have either begun with existence or non-existence, right? But it's neither existence nor non-existence, what's going on? Yeah. So I agree that I think there's a whole lot of anticipation of ideas that were drawn out in Buddhism and also in later forms of Hinduism and so on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also interesting to think of dependent origination as a creation myth because sort of the ultimate goal that's laid out is how to get uncreated. Right. You know, so it's All right. Yeah. That, you know, the, the, the goal is to cease existence. Yeah. So that's weird, isn't it? I say, right? The Buddha's, never underestimate the weirdness of the Buddha. Yeah? <laughs> like, 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 honestly, like we go around, we go around in this world, this is, this is what the thing is, and, and so dependent origination, like once we go through the definitions and the philosophies and these kinds of things, but it should kind of make you a bit queasy, right? And you should kind of reach a point where you're walking along the road and you're looking and you're going, what the is going on? <laughs> and what all is this? And you're like, uh, because this is like, this is like pulling the rug out from our whole world, right? You're starting to see the world in terms of these evolving and changing processes, right? You're not seeing the world in terms of pavements and bricks and buildings and people and these things that we think of so, and like that, even that idea like, like upadana, like grasping, right? Views and all of these kinds of things. And that, that really, each one of these gives us something to start investigating, right? Actually, like, because we define ourselves in terms of views. But the Buddha's saying, actually, this is, how, this is part of how we're creating suffering, right? So I'm this person, I have these views. I thought my views were good, right? I've spent so long defending them online, right? <laughs> right? I've invested all of this time and this energy every time, every time I find somebody who, oh my God, has a different view than I do, they must be corrected. And this, we, feel like, we feel like there's something wrong with the world until everyone in the world has exactly the same views as I do about everything that matters. Yeah, then we'd be happy. Finally, we wouldn't have to check the comments section. <laughs> of course, the reality is that the world would be very boring. Yeah. But so this views and these attachment to views, and you say, oh, actually, but what, what, what does that mean, right? Because if, that, if then I don't have any views, that seems weird, doesn't it? How do you get around without having them? Or do you have views and don't get attached to them? And so, so, and that's just one part, like that's just one bit of dependent origination, right? And then you look at another bit and it's talking about like contact and sense experience, right? And this is, gets even weirder because it's even more fundamental than views. What does it mean to say that, okay, so you have that, so you see, huh? and that seeing, creates an experience, an experience and that experience is somehow connected to the fact that we get, keep on getting caught up in suffering all the time, right? So what do we do about, like, can you then just not see? Is that the option? Can you stop it? How do you stop it, right? You want to cease it. How do you stop it? Just by not seeing? Does that help? Everything that we personalize. Detaching. Right. Yeah. So like not saying, you know, I exist. It's just a process of activities instead of like right. existing. I right. exist. Yeah. You know, it's just I'm just a process of activities just right. Right, and this this is what uh, we call I mentioned this yesterday, but this is what, what they call ahankara. Actually a really useful word. 
So ahankara, ahankara means eye making. Right? So it's this idea that this concept of an I, a concept of a self that we have inside ourselves, it's not just there, right? We have to keep building it up. And so through our thoughts and attitudes and things like that, we constantly have to build it up and reinforce it. Yeah? Which is giving us a clue. Right, because we are attached to the body, we think yeah. that the body is actually us. Mm. Like Right, yeah. We talked a lot about this yesterday, actually, with the to in, to in the context of the five aggregates uh, and that idea of attachment to the different parts of the aggregate. But yeah, so this whole kind of thing, we're like on this, you know, if we start with ignorance, like, okay, so starting with ignorance in a way is, starting with ignorance is good. Why? Because it's pretty straightforward. Right? It's quite knowable. Right? We, can, we can know that we're, we, we don't know about certain things. We can accept the fact that we are ignorant about things. That's why you're all here. Right? You're all here to join a class and learn something. Right? So you acknowledge that you're ignorant. So that's a starting point. Okay, that's good. Nice. And not only it means that we, we can accept that and it's a reality, but also it means that we share something in common with other people. Right? <laughs> the Ship of Fools. Yeah, which actually would be a great name for a monastery, right? <laughs> Balanava. That would be my third monastery. Maybe we'll make a branch monastery, yeah. <laughs> Balanava. I like it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Balanava Hermitage, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so. So, so we and so there's some aspects of this which are, which is good, but it's also a bit worrying, right? Because if we're really ignorant, then how do we know how to get out of it, right? I mean, we're lost, we're confused, we're wandering around in the dark without having any idea of like where we are, what are we doing, where do we want to go, what is dark, who am I, what is a road. Where are we going to get make a starting point? Where are we going to make a starting point? Just when I came over here, went th went through th going through the airport in um, uh, where was it Santa Cruz or something? No, anyway, San Francisco, somewhere near. And I saw someone with a T-shirt that, that said a very famous line from Tolkien: "Not all those who wander are lost." Nice to see that in an airport, right? But it really struck me, you know, I've heard that line so, you know, I grew up reading Tolkien, you know, and you have heard that line so many times before, but it's beautiful, isn't it? Not all those who wander are lost. And so I think, like, we're all wandering, and we might not know exactly what we're doing. We might not know exactly what the path that we're on is, or where we're going, where our next step is, or any of those kinds of things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're lost. We have something, right? I mean, we have the Dhamma, that's giving it, that's something, that's, that's not a little bit, right? That's a lot. We have our own wisdom, right? That we've learnt through our hard won experience. Again, not a small thing. We have each other, right? our good friends, spiritual friends on the path, who are there to tell us to get back in our lane, right? to give us some encouragement when we feel down, to get us up in the morning and say, get up and meditate, you lazy slob. <laughs> <Right? laughs> <laughs> Not in that language, but much, yeah. much less polite language. <laughs> and, right? So, not all those who wander are lost. Well, you're describing the refuges, aren't you? 
maybe. Yeah. Okay. So the 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 truths. Remember, remember that these truths that the Buddha said are hard for people to understand. And for us to really take these on board, really appreciate what it is that they're saying, it's really challenging. And so don't kind of dismiss it. I don't want you to sort of go away from today's workshop and, and then say, oh, that was a nice workshop. I learned a bit about dependent origination. I want you to go away from this workshop and say, oh my God, what is the meaning of my life? Everything I've done is wasted. <laughs> and what the heck am I doing here? Right? That's <laughs> that's what I wanted. I want I want I want a few good existential crises. Existential, <laughs> existential nausea is good, yeah. Existential nausea is good, yeah. <laughs> and like sometimes when we come to a spiritual path, right? Sometimes we have a spiritual path whose purpose is to like make us feel good, right? Just you know, a bit of relaxing, nice, you know, a couple of scented candles, a bit of a massage, <laughs> feel better about it, go back to work today. That's nice, right? There's nothing wrong with that, right? If you want to do that, that's fine. But but when you start to look more deeply, you start to look more deeply at something like dependent origination, it should be really challenging us. And should be challenging us with questions about like what am I how am I living? Right? What, how, how does, if, if the world is like this, how, how, how am I living in this world? Yeah? We're living in this world where nothing is certain, nothing is guaranteed. And, you know, we're here, we're talking about dependent origination, we're talking about like one's own, like per, it's the primary focus is like the personal existence and our. our the state and being and our choices and consequences and all of that kind of thing, but also has a communal aspect. In, in the Aganya Sutta I mentioned before, it's like a creation sutta, but there it talks about the conditionality of, of humanity and the environment, right? And actually develops a theory of anthropogenic global climate change, right? The climate changes and evolves because of human activity. That's explicitly taught in the Pali suttas. There will come a time when the fire element is disrupted and the entire world burns up. That's just conditioned changes. There come a time when the water element is disturbed and everything floods. That time was Hurricane Sandy. We've seen that here. These kinds of dis disruptions and uncertainties with the climate crisis with political instability, economic instability, all of these kinds of things that are challenging us. All of these also are dependently originated and they, uh, they arise, you know, craving, greed, all of these kinds of things. So somehow we have to make our way in this world. Not all those who wander are lost. <coughs> And we have an opportunity, those of us who have been lucky enough to encounter the Dhamma, we have an opportunity to reflect on this and to reflect on ourselves as wanderers, to understand, number one, that we are in fact wandering. Wouldn't the world be a much better place if we had fewer people who knew and more people who are ignorant. Yeah. So when we're starting independent origination, we're starting with that idea of ignorance. So don't think of that as necessarily kind of a bad thing. It's just nature. It's just, it's just how it is. We don't really know what we're doing. But because of that ignorance, we make choices good choices, bad choices. And then that those choices create an energy that empowers our consciousness to go into different states. And then that's what fuels this whole cycle and this whole process. <coughs> Yeah.
in this uh, t today in this process we are uh, hopefully like I said at the beginning I hopefully I want to sort of you know take you from a, a zero level of knowledge to a negative level of knowledge right so to increase but what I really mean is to we, we can really increase our awareness of our unawareness right? and the more that we can be aware of what we don't know the more we're opening up the avenue to actually knowing and the good news is that that too is a natural process. Ignorance and falling into the whole thing of suffering is a natural process. But the way out of suffering is just as much a natural process. And just as all of that suffering flows from ignorance, then the ending of suffering flows from understanding. And in that understanding, there's a sense of joy. And that joy brings peace. The peace brings clarity. The clarity brings stillness. The stillness brings insight. The insight brings freedom. This too is a natural process. And it's a process that I hope we are all participating in one way or another yeah. over to you yeah doesn't it kind of I mean it's like coming to me that it all boils down to the only choice is to follow the eightfold path uh-huh and that gets you out of all of it right and it starts with the whole ignorance thing starts with there is a self. Right. right. And, the, and the Eightfold Path starts with the right view, which is to undo, undoing the ignorance. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Push P. Um, how do you differentiate Moha and Avicca? Okay. So here, did everybody hear that question? No. No. So you guys are on different sides of the room. So you're kind of talking. In uh, I'll just write these down here. No, that's wrong. Uh. Right. So we have basically two two different words in in Buddhism. A lot of other words, but these are two important ones to talk about this idea of, of unknowing or ignorance or something. One is moha, usually translated as delusion, and the other one is avijja, uh, usually translated as ignorance. Okay, so the question is, what's the difference between these two things? Now, on the one hand, well, there isn't really any difference; they're basically the same thing. Okay, but there is a kind of a slight, I guess, difference in emphasis. Uh, which is that um, ignorance is, is ignorance is more kind of fundamental. It's more kind of passive. Ignorance is just the base kind of unknowing or not knowing of things. Whereas delusion or moha is more like an active force that twists knowing, right? That twists your mind to hide the truth from you. Yeah. Again, it's not like an absolute difference, but that force in the mind that. When you start to, there's a, there's a nice little kind of uh, parable about this. It's a bit like the um, uh, the story of Job, uh, and in this this story, a man is walking along the path, uh, and the Buddha and Mara are watching him. And as he's, as he's walking along the path, he bends over and he notices a piece of truth on the path. He bends over and picks up the piece of truth, and then when he does that, Mara smiles. And the Buddha says, Mara, why are you smiling? Mara, for those of you who don't know, Mara is the, the, the Buddhist sort of god of, he's like the Buddhist Satan, right? the tempter, the trickster, the god of the bad things. Sorry? The controller. Maybe. Like yeah. yeah. The, and so, but the Buddha says to Mara, Mara, why are you smiling? He just picked up a piece of the truth. And Mara says, ah, yes, but give him another few steps and he'll make a view out of it. 
<laughs> yeah. So this is delusion. That's how delusion works. You have yes, it's just something true in that, but then what you make of it, how you treat it in your mind, you twist it into something which actually is very far from the truth. This is why it's so hard to actually to to find the truth. Yeah. That one? Yeah, the, the that story? story? No. I read it I read it years ago. I can't even remember where it was. Do anyone know where that's from? It might be a Zen story or something. I, I honestly have no idea. I might have just made it up. <laughs> 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 I don't think so though. I think I read it somewhere. <laughs> Citation needed. <laughs> Okay. Good. So uh, now, why don't we uh, go ahead? And like I said, that you know, there's there's so many interesting suttas on dependent origination and so many things. And so, one of the, the sort of the points that we've come to at this point is to look at uh, like the relate, like the idea of like how do we kind of get out of it, right? I mean. <laughs> You know, honestly, it's such a rich teaching that you can you can draw on any of these threads and any of these links and ideas, and you know, weave a whole thing out of it. But let's just look at one uh, sutta, which is an interesting and uh, slightly uh, unusual sutta, uh, in that it integrates dependent origination with other aspects of the teaching in in different ways. So, you, is this going to give you kind of some kind of sense? of how the teaching can be, this particular teaching can be applied in some different ways. Right? It's quite a well-known sutta uh, called the Titayatana Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, uh, th sorry, 3.61, if anybody wants to find it, and 3.61. Mendicants, these three sectarian tenets as pursued, pressed and grilled by the astute when taken to their conclusion end with inaction. What three? There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Everything this individual experiences, pleasurable, painful or neutral, is because of past deeds. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine and view. Everything this individual experiences, pleasurable, painful or neutral, is because of the Lord God's creation. Isara yeah. Nimana Hetu. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine of view. Everything this individual experiences, pleasurable, painful, or neutral, has no cause or reason. Ahetu Apachaya. Uh, let me just turn on that Pali uh, thingy. I should have. Where are we going? No, not Chinese. Look up Pali. Look up. Uh, where are we now? Okay, so three, 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 so it's called sectarian tenets, and these are the three sectarian tenets. Okay, one is the so views held by people who are not Buddhists. Uh, so these are the other, some of the other groups and teachings and so on at the time. So three kinds of views. One is that everything is produced from past karma, sabangtang pubakata hetu. Another one is that everything is created by God, isara nimana hetu. And the other one is that things have no cause or condition. Ahetu apachaya. Regarding this, I went up to the ascetics and Brahmins whose view is that everything is experienced because that everything that is experienced is because of past deeds. And I said it to them, is it really true that this is your view? Okay, so a few things to notice here. So the Buddha is talking about uh, views which are held by various people at the time in ancient India, two and a half thousand years ago. All right. So there's, I mean, this already is quite interesting. Number one is you can see how diverse the different views were, right? It's not that like everybody had the same kind of view. Actually, all these are quite very different views. Another thing that's interesting is that these are all very recognizable views that you can read about here, here today. Many people have exactly these same views today, right? It's weird, right? We think we're so modern, everything's so changed, right? <laughs> 
actually it's just variations on a theme. These same basic philosophical ideas are talked about and debated at that same time. Another thing that's interesting, what does the Buddha do about it? He went up to those ascetics and Brahmins and he asked them, is this what you say? Right? So normally our preferred method is to whinge and gossip and complain about people and say they're all wrong. I don't know how effective that is. So the Buddha's approach is to actually go to them and say, well, look, I've heard that this is what they're saying. Is this really true? This is really powerful and it's really worth bearing in mind. This is something which is a fundamental principle in the Buddhist Vinaya, which is the monastic code for the monks and the nuns. Right? And you see what happens in the Vinaya. If somebody comes to the Buddha and complains, such and such a monk did this, the first thing that the Buddha does is say, well, ask him to come here. And then the monk comes here and says, is it true that you did this? <laughs> and it sounds simple, right? But it's not what we do, right? I mean, in your company, is that what happens when somebody complains or so-and-so in their cubicle, they're doing this and they're doing that? Is that what you do? First thing, go and say, is it true? And no, it's not usually, right? This is right, part of right speech, yeah? And this is part of what is really powerful. Is it true? And so many problems and misunderstandings could be alleviated just by asking that. And so he went them and asked them. And so another thing also to acknowledge is, to, is how much of the Buddha's teachings is in fact an interfaith dialogue. Right? And this is very uh, particular to the early Buddhist texts. At the beginning of the day we talked a little bit about what the different uh, strata of Buddhist texts are and so on. And we have one strata of texts, which is what we call the suttas or the early Buddhist texts, it's mainly what we're dealing with. Now, one of the, to, to determine that these texts are in fact early, we use multiple different criteria, right? Uh, and I wrote a book on this with my friend uh, Venerable Brahmali a few years ago called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Texts. And if you're interested in this question, please do have a look at it because what we did with that book is we uh, gathered together as many different kind of arguments and evidences and so on from as many different places as we could find that talk about whether these things are authentic. And one of the points that we wanted to make by doing this is that you can't determine whether something's authentic or not by just sort of pointing to one feature, right? It's not that it's got like signature at the end that you can say this was you know, definitely by so-and-so, but you have to look at it from so many different angles and so many different things. And one of those ways that we looked at and we noticed with the early Buddhist texts is that the Buddha is constantly talking to people who are not Buddhists. And you hardly ever find that in any later Buddhist texts. It almost never happens. Everything after the Buddha is Buddhists talking to other Buddhists kind of like what we're doing here. I mean, I assume not everyone here is probably Buddhist, but you know, more or less, we're talking in a Buddhist, or Buddhist kind of audience or Buddhist context. And you know, if I was talking in a local church or a local mosque, and I do a lot of interfaith work in Australia, you know, we're constantly doing this kind of thing, then obviously I would speak differently. I would have a different set of assumptions and a different set of questions, and we would discuss different types of topics. Right? So this is what we find the Buddha doing, constantly engaging with the people around him, He's not just talking to the, the monks and nuns in his monastery. He's going out and, you know, he goes up to them and asks them, right? <laughs> you know, wanders into the local church and says, oh, hey, how's it going? Look, I was wondering what you guys believe about this and have a conversation about that. Yeah? And it's really important that this, that this has happened. And there's many, many instances of that happening in the suttas. Not just once or twice, but many, many, many times. And they're all very interesting. And the Buddha isn't... The Buddha doesn't have like a sort of a simple, the Buddha's, Buddha's philosophical approach, he, he said himself, he defined as being vibhajavadan, meaning he, he has a doctrine of analysis and making distinctions. So he doesn't just have like one approach. So he doesn't just wander around and say, all religions are the same, right? Nor does he wander around and say, well, my religion's the best and what you're teaching is bad. But he wanders around and say, he says, what actually is it that you guys are saying, right? It's very one of the nicest ones where he walked into the ashram. He, you know, he got got ready in the morning to go for arms round into the village. And he walks out into the village, and then he realizes, oh, hang on, it's too early to go for arms round. All right? So the Buddha got the time for arms round wrong, which also is a very inspiring characteristic. 
And then he <laughs> decided, oh, I'll wander into the ashram of the other sectarians, like he's talking about here. And when he goes to there, there's a group of them sitting around having a chat. And they say, shh, you know, the Buddha's coming. Like, he, he likes quiet, so let's just be quiet, so he'll, he'll think that we're good. And then <laughs> when the Buddha comes up, he says, uh, you know, they say, welcome, please come in. They're all very polite. And the leader of that group said to the Buddha, you know, please tell us, what is your teaching? And the Buddha said to them, well, don't worry about that. You know, I'd be interested to hear you tell me what your teaching is. And when they said that, they were just gobsmacked. And the teacher said, I said, I've never seen anything like this before. He said, every time before, when any philosopher or ascetic has wandered by, they just can't wait to tell us all about their theories. And here the Buddha comes, and not only does he not try to push his ideas on us, he actually asks us to explain our teachings to him. Yeah? It made such an impression on them. This, and these are some of the reasons why reading the suttas is so powerful, right? Because actually all of us are in that situation, right? We're all in situations, probably pretty much every day, where we're talking to people who aren't Buddhists or whatever. And you get these examples of how to interact and to relate to people. Right? It's teaching you these things. And when, you know, when I learned this thing, I've taken a lot of these lessons on board for the way that I do interfaith. Yeah? And uh, I'll just give you one example of how, how we do that. I did one interfaith gig in Canberra many years ago. And uh, it was on in Australia. Uh, so, so just to be clear, you know, you've heard of Australia, right? <laughs> As, uh, we, we hear these stories about Americans and their geographical knowledge. So I just need to check how we're going here, right? You realize that like, right? There's the, the, well, first thing, there's like, there's like something outside of America. It's, it's, called, it's called the rest of the world, right? And <laughs> in that the rest of the world, uh, there's a place called Australia. And Australia is part of the British Commonwealth still, for some crazy reason. I don't really know why. But anyway, so we have this kind of thing. And, there, and so we have a Commonwealth Day. And, you know, the, sometimes the, the Queen of England. So Australia, you might not know, actually, Australia has our head of state in Australia is a governor general. We don't have a president. We have a governor general who's appointed by the Queen formally, right? So it's actually an unelected head of state who has the power to dismiss the government and who in fact did dismiss the government in 1975. So this is how the Australian government is set up. Yeah, it's kind of problematic. Uh, anyway, so normally the, head, normally the governor general is kind of a, you know, dignitary and doesn't have much power, but they do formally have the power to dismiss the government. Anyway, so we did this Commonwealth meeting, the Governor General's there, there's all these kind of bishops and all these kinds of important people and things like that. And usually because Buddhism is excellent for those who really dislike organized religion, so we don't have anything organized and, and no one knows what to do. So they end up, end up inviting me along to these kinds of things. And so anyway, and all the different religious people are there, right? They have this kind of panel. And we all have to say something. And these are, these are supposed to be speaking from the people who are representing the religions which are found within the diversity of the Commonwealth. Right? So we have the, India is also part of the Commonwealth. So we have the Hindu speaker. Uh, there are lots of Islamic countries like Bangladesh, which are part of the Commonwealth. So a Muslim speaker and so on. And Buddhists also speaking uh, because Sri Lanka, I guess. Sri Lanka is part of the British Commonwealth. Yeah. So Sri Lanka. So we get to speak on that. And each one of the speakers got up and said, you know, this is what Hinduism is and explain what it is. This is what Christianity is. We explain what this is. This is what Islam is. We'll explain what it is. Now, this is Commonwealth Day, right? And the British Commonwealth is a very problematic institution. No. Yeah? And colonialism is a kind of really problematic thing, right? I know, right? And so... You know, but it's also true that the nations of the Commonwealth decided to stay in the Commonwealth, right? They weren't forced to, so for some reason they decided to stay in. So I thought, well, I'll, 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 I'll talk about something good that the British did. And so I said, well, as Buddhists, we're grateful to the British because the British uh, archaeological department, led by Cunningham, rediscovered all the sacred sites of India. 
and he found Bodh Gaya and he connected all of those places and put them all together. And I talked about some of the positive things that the British had actually done to contribute to the direction of Buddhism. Not to ignore all the many awful things that they also did, <laughs> but this was supposed to be a day of celebration, right? <laughs> so you know, I just mentioned some of those things. And afterwards I went, you know, after this bit of chit chat, and uh, someone came up to me and he said, he said, you were the only person that didn't stand there and say how good your religion was. You're the only person who actually expressed gratitude for somebody else. Yeah. And that's what he came away and that's what he remembered. Yeah. So this is, this is something about like what I've learned from, from the Buddha and how he engages with these things. So don't, when, when, we're, when we're talking to people, like for you, each one of you, when you're talking to people from different religions and different backgrounds, don't just platitude at them. Right? Listen to them appreciate them don't feel threatened if someone has a different view than yours good I'm really happy to learn from you what is your view if there's something similar that's good if there's something different that's also fine the Buddha wasn't erasing differences if you erase all differences boring right differences are fun yeah but don't go around shooting each other because of it right you can have a philosophical argument about it that's fine Right? But you can still, like the Buddha, would go to the ashram and have a discussion and they'd come there and they'd have these discussions. And it's a discussion in good faith because you're all interested to understand the truth and to understand each other. Yeah. yeah. But people do that now, so let's say, you know, a, a Muslim or a Christian, hmm. or, so they might find that as an opportunity to ostracize you and try to bring you into their fold and, hey, you know, my name is better than, you know, why don't you join us? Right. In which case, we have to invoke very very important line in the Buddhist texts which I will find right now <laughs> now this is a very good point okay so um, uh, I'm just trying to think where, where are we in in the uh, suttas sorry in in sorry not in suttas. there are many uh, many times when engaging in interfaith dialogue and these things it feels like it feels a bit kind of um, it feels a bit uh, manipulative right because it feels like it's not really done in good faith yeah actually someone is not um, not really having a conversation but they're really just there to try to get you to do something for them mm. right so this is where I think it's really important to remember the first line of the Mangala Sutta <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know Mangala, this is the Mangala Sutta. This is one of the most famous suttas in all of Buddhism, recited in one of the Parita chanting ceremonies that we do all the time. We all remember it. Asevana Chabalanang. And, you know, you know, if you read something like the Dhammapada or the Mangala Sutta, it's so beautiful, right? Everything is, everything is like, you know, to be educated, to have a vocation, to be well trained, support your mother and father. Everything is really so straightforward, so clear. And there's no kind of problem with anything. But then when I first read this, I read it and it said, not to associate with fools. Well, is that right? I thought that was a bit, bit problematic, right? Because I'm like, surely, we, you know, shouldn't we try to help people? Who, who's to say well, who's a fool, right? If I'm saying someone else is a fool, then I must be saying I'm not a fool. And I sort of struggled with this line for years right? until I discovered the internet. <laughs> and then you realize, ah, that's what the Buddha was talking about. Because yeah? right? you see so much of bad faith conversations, right? Where, you know, it's not actually people trying to, you know, have a meeting of mind or something like that. And, and actually, the very fact that you have the conversation means they won. Because you're having a conversation, the space is filled with all of this meaningless crap. I mean, you know, climate change denialism is the biggest example of it. If they filled news and all of these things with this meaningless, completely useless crap for years, and the planet is doomed because of it. I mean, this is not just a. This is not just. It's not just a. It's not just a waste of time. It's incredibly harmful. And the more the older and the grumpier I get, 
the more that I think that this line is like really important not to associate with fools. We had a lot of discussion because part of sort of central we run a forum. And part of the forum, of course, you have to do moderation. And we have a wonderful moderation team. Kara, shout out to Kara, one of our original moderators. Right? Right? Sadu, sadu, sadu. Moderators underappreciated, but they are the only people that stand between the internet and a much worse internet. <laughs> right? <laughs> And if you think that it's bad now, imagine what it would be like if it wasn't moderated and people have to actually deal with all of the crap and the people that, you know, if you're on a Buddhist forum, I mean, okay, there are obvious cases. I mean, there's the Nazis, right? The Nazi Buddhists. Like legitimate actual Nazis, like a monk who's like legitimately doing a Hitler salute to a Buddha image. Like that kind of Nazi. Oh, yeah. In America, yeah, America and Canada, yeah, like uh, you know, monks writing long, explicit anti-Semitic screeds saying that the Jews were really responsible for the Holocaust and they had it coming. That kind of Nazi, <laughs> right? <laughs> so once you get rid of those, and of course, like the, the ped pedophiles. So then. You know, and obviously on our forum, we're not dealing with these kind of content to the same extent that they are on something like Facebook or something like that. But, you know, I've, I've already said delete Facebook to here. Hi, Facebook. Shout out to everyone watching it <laughs> if you haven't deleted it yet. But just remember one thing to remember. Running Facebook ruins people's lives. You know, read the articles. There's some long and fantastic articles about the moderators of Facebook. And it absolutely destroys people's lives because you're exposed to this vile, horrible, unbelievable crap that's pouring out in rivers on these platforms every single day. And you've got to try to control it. And yeah. they also get to watch your talks live. They do get to watch my talks live, yeah. <laughs> Could be, there are other ways of doing that, I'm saying. Anyway, so this is a, this is a real thing, right? This is a real thing. And so I think it's, it's important to, and so one of the things that we've discussed on our forum is like how, how far do you take this, right? One of the kind of the funny dynamics, which is kind of funny ha-ha to me, is that, and Kara will confirm this, I'm always telling the moderators, just ban them, right? <laughs> just get rid of them um, and, and invoke this particular line. And then we're like, oh, well, you know, let's try to reach out to them and try to reason with them and hopefully they'll blah, blah, blah. I'm saying, yeah, if you want to, but I'd just ban them. And, but the moderator forum is independent. Right? The moderators make their, make their own decisions. And so usually what happens is that they then reach out to someone, try to help them, and then they come to me and message me privately saying, oh, these moderators are so bad, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, dude, if you only knew. <laughs> right? So, and why, why I, I'm, I'm sort of pro-banning people? I mean. I've, I've been through this, I'm, I'm serious, and it's imp I've been through this myself, I, I was viciously stalked on the internet at one point, to the point I had to seek police protection. Um, you know, someone accusing me of rape and murder and all of these things, I'd never met this person, and sending like thousands of messages to all Buddhist societies all around the world, accusing me of all of these things, right? So, you know, eventually I had to go to the police and say, look, I don't wish any harm on this person, but I just want them to stop, you know. Uh, they did, yeah. We met, managed to identify them and, and uh, I haven't had any trouble since then. So I assume I don't know, they, they, they weren't able to tell me exactly what happened, but normally they'd, they'd basically put a ban. They couldn't like use the Internet. They probably had like mandatory psychiatric care or something like that. Um, Anyway, it worked out quite well for me, luckily, because I went down to the local police station and the policewoman there is like, oh, I saw the Dalai Lama at the talk last week and uh... <laughs> <laughs> so she was very amenable. Uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, so getting, getting kind of off the point, but, but, but the, uh, where were we on the point? Oh, yes. So don't be afraid if when you know that that situation is happening and this person is not engaging in a good faith argument the best thing is to just walk away from the table and what they really want people like that really want or kind of the trolls and denialists and things like that they they want a seat at the grown-ups table they want to be taken seriously but the problem is they're idiots 
right? And they come and they say, oh, you know, we believe that, that, that God created the universe in 4000 BC and that should be taught in like a biology class, right? And there's no point in sitting down and reasoning it. It's not going to happen, right? So you have to walk away from the table and they have to learn that if they keep pushing these ideas, they're not going to get a seat, you know, in that, in that rational conversation Cause, yeah. because they're not, they're not taking part properly. For some of these people, you know, the religion is that 24-7, 365 days a year, right. every moment of the life is religion. Yeah. So, you know, as soon as somebody even remotely uh, trying to come say, hey, what about religion? Boom, boom there you go. You know, that's yeah. Right there. yeah. So, I don't right, know it just switches is. on, yeah? Huh? Yeah, it yeah. just, yeah. So many yeah. fools have kind of almost completely taken over the table, though. Right. You yeah, don't make me even more cynical than I was I'm before, sorry. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, you know, and it's true. And, and, and uh, I mean, we can have a longer conversation about this, but I think that, that I think a big part of it is the fact that we, uh, we shifted our conversation to a digital medium without actually understanding at all like not at all the psychological and cultural impact and and factors you know we had the technology to do that and we didn't have the culture and, and all of that stuff yeah so this kind of environment is actually much healthier right if you try to have a discussion online with with people from different religious views it's bad but this is much nicer where someone goes to their place and asks them about their opinions right it's a much healthier environment and you can actually talk to people as human beings. So this is something, I'm, I'm putting this out and I'm emphasizing it because it's something I think that every one of you should be doing. Yeah, in one way or another. Yeah, reaching out to people who are different and asking them about views. Not necessarily tolerating the idiots, okay. You know, you get some full-on evangelist or something, you can just walk away. But if someone's reasonable and wants to engage, then that's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah. Anyway, let's, let's move on. They're getting, getting a bit close to the end, so they said yes. So, is everything because of what you did in the past, your past karma? And then, in that case, you might live, kill living beings, steal, be unchaste, use speech that's false, device harsh or nonsensical, be covered as malicious or have wrong view, all because of past deeds. So if everything's caused by the past, then the actions that we're doing now are also caused by what's done in the past. This list of things, for example, by the way, is the 10 uh, uh, ways of unwholesome deeds. So this is a stock list of the different kinds of bad things that you can do by way of body, speech and mind. So those who believe that past deeds are the most important thing have no enthusiasm or effort, no idea that there are things that should and should not be done. So those who pubakatang sarato pachagachatang, who fall back on what was done in the past as the essence, is a more literal translation. Since those, since they don't acknowledge as a general, genuine fact that there are things that should and should not be done, they're unmindful and careless and can't rightly be called ascetics. This is my first legitimate refutation of the ascetics and Brahmins who have this doctrine in view. Now regarding this, I went up to the ascetics and Brahmins whose view is that everything is experienced, everything that is experienced is because of the Lord God's creation. And I said to them, is it really true that this is the Venerable's view? So again, notice he's, Buddha's using a, a respectful term of address there. They answered, yes. I said to them, in that case, you might kill living creatures, steal, be unchaste, use speech that's false, divisive, harsh, or nonsensical, be covetous, malicious, and or have wrong view, all because of the Lord God's creation. Right? So no matter, you can do all of these bad things and just say, God made me do it. <laughs> right? Uh, those who believe that the God, Lord God's creative power is the most important thing have no enthusiasm, no effort, no idea that there are things that should or should not be done. And of course this is actually a very real issue. We were discussing this a bit earlier today, that, like that divide in Christianity, the conflict between sort of salvation by faith and salvation by deeds. Right? And so here this is essentially is that same distinction which the Buddha is pointing to here. I, I, I would just, just say, just, you know, brought up as a Catholic myself, I mean, there's, there's something to be said for the idea that having those two incompatible ideas is actually a healthy thing in a spiritual tradition. Because it's, it, it creates a sense of dynamism and stops you from getting too dogmatic. So you can have these two contrasting principles 
and that the interplay between them can actually be healthy, right? So I don't, uh, but anyway, yeah. Okay, second legitimate refutation. I always remember um, Cape Fear. I don't know if anyone remembers Cape Fear, thriller from the early 90s, Robert De Niro. Yeah. And then he had a car, he was a serial killer, and on the car, he was a Catholic serial killer. <laughs> His car, he had a, had a sticker saying, both of us are sinners, but one of us is saved. Yeah, it's taking it to a somewhat extreme point of view, yeah. Okay, I went up to those ascetics and Brahmins whose view is that everything that is experienced has no cause or reason. And I said to them, is it really true that this is the Venerable's view? Yes, I said to them, in that case, you might kill living creatures, steal, be unchaste, use speech that's false, divisive, harsh or nonsensical, be covetous, malicious or have wrong view, all without cause or reason. Right? So you say, oh, you know, I'm doing these bad things, sure, but there's no reason for it. Why not? Right? And of course, there, there were in fact spiritual teachers in the time of the Buddha who taught this. I mean, we, we, tend, we like to pride ourselves on having kind of re religious diversity and being tolerant and so on. But actually, would we tolerate a religion that taught there's actually no such thing as good and evil? And you can just go around murdering people all day and not do anything bad because of it? I think we'd have difficult... Sorry? <laughs> I don't... Satanism... Yeah, is this a satanic temple? Yeah, but I don't actually think that they really teach teach that kind of thing. They're actually so somebody. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Satan, Satan, of course, is Lucifer. Lucifer is from an Indo-European word, which, has, which means the, 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 the shining one, which is actually cognate with the Pali or the Sanskrit word Rochana, which is a word for the Buddha. <laughs> Vairochana. <laughs> Just saying. I'm not, sa I'm not saying that you should get an image of Baphomet in the corner, but I didn't say that you should not get one either. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> there, was an, there was an article in the paper some years ago. Somebody, somebody wrote that they'd a study of the Bible or something had f had found out that the number of the beast was not really six six six. That we'd got it wrong. It was actually something else. So they rang up the Church of Satan and they asked them about it. What do you think now that we found out that the number of the beast is not really six six six? Does that challenge your faith? They said, Oh, not really. We're we're mostly just about annoying the Christians. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so there we go. Uh, I can't run to be called ascetics. Okay, so these three kinds of ideas. So the sectarian tenets, one being that everything is um, uh, determined by past karma, another thing being that everything is uh, caused by God, another thing being that things have no cause at all. Uh, these are all according to this refutation shown as being uh, uh, untenable as the basis for a spiritual life. So the Buddha isn't so much here, in this particular case, he's not so much here concerned with showing whether they're correct or not. He's concerned with showing whether they can be the basis for a genuine spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. right? This is mainly what he's, he's about in this particular case. And they end with inaction. So he's not saying they're untrue, he's saying they end with inaction. If you really follow the implications of these to their final point, then you'd be like, well, why bother? All right? Okay. But the Dhamma that I've taught is irrefutable, in uncorrupted beyond reproach, and not scorned by sensible ascetics and Brahmans. What is the Dhamma that I've taught? And he goes on. There are these six elements. This is the Dhamma I've taught. Uh, there are the six fields of contact. There are 18 mental preoccupations, the Four Noble Truths. And so the six elements, I'm, I'm rushing through it a little bit because we're getting a bit late, so I'll just go a little bit more quickly. And six elements, the elements of earth, water, fire, air, space, and consciousness. These are the six elements. Six fields of contact, which are ear, uh, so eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind contact. 
which we've already encountered in dependent origination before. Then there are these 18 mental preoccupations. Seeing a sight with the eye, one is preoccupied with a sight that's a basis for happiness or sadness or equanimity. The idea here, it's a little bit of a, a tricky one to translate properly, but the idea here is that when you, when you, when you see something, like sight itself is, is kind of neutral, but you tend to sort of hang around or notice something because it stimulates some response to it. Right? So you see something beautiful, you want to go back and look at that and hang out. Or maybe you see something very ugly and then this is kind of draws your mind in some way and then that creates some kind of response. Yeah. So this is those, those 18 mental preoccupations. Okay, so six senses and one for each of the, the three feelings, pleasant, painful and neutral with each of the six senses. These are the Four Noble Truths. Sup why did I say it? Supported by the six elements, right? Back to the six elements. We, so the Buddha, notice how the Buddha's teaching. He's laying out the elements of his teaching, right? And now he's showing how they're all connected. Based on the six elements, earth, water, fire, air, space, and consciousness, uh, an embryo is conceived. Upadaya gabhasava kanti hoti. When it is conceived, there, is, there are name and form. Okantiya sati namarupang. So name and form is in here is closely associated with the development of the embryo in the womb. And this is not the only place where this happens. Right? We already saw in Majima, what is it, 38? Uh, the, yes, that's right, Majima 38, the connection of dependent origination with conception and with growth and womb, that organic thing. And here it is again, and there are other places as well where that's happening. When that embryo is conceived, there's name and form. Name and form are conditions for the six sense fields. Again, that idea of development, right? So the embryo is growing and developing these six senses. The six sense fields are conditions for contact. Contact is a condition for feeling. Right. So again, in notice again in how all of these things that the Buddha is drawing together, those elements that he laid out before. Right? The six senses, the six fields of contact, the 18 mental preoccupations, now is it all being drawn into here. Contact is a condition for feeling. It is for one who feels that I declare this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. Vediamanasa Kopanahang Bikwe Irang Dukanti Panyapemi. Ayang Dukasamurayoti Panyapemi. Ayang Dukani Rod Hoti Panyapemi. Ayang Dukani Rod Hagamini Patipadati Panyapemi. One of my favorite lines in the whole of the Pali Canon. Yeah. To me, and I mean, it's just so beautiful. Yeah? For one who feels. Where do you man us? You know, one of the things, those of you who've been to my talks will know that one of the things I joke around at the start of the suttas, I say, you know, is everyone feeling good? And everyone says yes. And I say, well, you should go home. <laughs> because I'm only interested in people who are suffering. All right? For the one who feels. And this is our starting point, right? That we have these feelings, we have these experiences, we have these sufferings, these feelings of happiness and sadness. That's who the Buddha is teaching for. So never, never think that, you know, sometimes, sometimes we, we, we think maybe as Buddhists that we should be happy or that we should be loving or anything like that. It's okay, it's good to feel those things. But you're not always going to feel those things. And that's just how emotions go. That's how feelings are. It's okay, right? And when you're going through that darkest time and you're feeling lonely and you're feeling anxious and you're feeling depressed and you're feeling hopeless, you think, ah, oh, that's who the Buddha was teaching for. The Buddha was teaching for me. Yeah? Yeah, remember, what is it, that old Bruce Springsteen song, Roy Orbison singing for the lonely. Hey, that's me. Yeah? The Buddha is teaching for you. And that's a beautiful thing to remember. Yeah? When you're at your lowest point, remember, ah, this is, the, this, is what, this is what the Buddha meant. This is what he was talking to. Vedi yeah? manasa. And what is the noble truth of suffering? And so here we have the uh, basic definition of the noble truth of suffering. Of course, this is a whole other workshop. But uh, rebirth is suffering, old age is suffering, of course, a lot, of, a lot in common with dependent origination. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, sadness, so pain, sadness, and distress are suffering. Association with dislike to suffering. Separation from the like to suffering. Not getting what you wish for is suffering. In brief, 
For the five grasping aggregates of suffering. This is the noble truth of suffering. What's the noble truth of the origin of suffering? Now normally, the, no, the, or, the second noble truth, the origin of suffering, is defined as craving. Right? But here, the Buddha gives it the whole of dependent origination in the origin of suffering. Ignorance is a condition for choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Name and form are conditions for the six sense fields. The six sense fields are conditions for contact. Contact is a condition for feeling. Feeling is a condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, lamentation pain, sadness and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. This is called the noble truth of the origin of suffering. Mm. Yeah? So this whole thing is now wrapping up dependent origination inside the Four Noble Truths. And what's the noble truth of the cessation of suffering? When ignorance fades away and ceases with nothing left over, choices cease. When choices cease, consciousness ceases. When consciousness ceases, name and form cease. When name and form cease, the six sense fields cease. When the six sense fields cease, consciousness ceases. When con co contact ceases. When contact ceases, feeling ceases. When feeling ceases, craving ceases. When craving ceases, grasping ceases. When grasping ceases, continued existence ceases. When continued existence ceases, rebirth ceases. When rebirth ceases, old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress cease. That is how this entire mass of suffering ceases. This is called the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. And what is the noble truth of the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering? The fourth noble truth is simply this noble eightfold path. That is, right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right immersion. This is called the noble truth of the practice that leads to the cessation of suffering. These are the four noble truths. This is the Dhamma that I've heard, uh, sorry, that I've taught that is irrefutable, uncorrupted, beyond reproach and is not scorned by sensible ascetics and brahmins. That's what I said and this is why I said it. So this is the sectarian tenets sutta, Angudra 3.61 Okay, so got a bit of time left. Any questions? Thoughts? Yeah, go on. Well, I think we touched on it yesterday in the choices one. <laughs> right. So there seems to be a trick there because the noble eightfold path is just basically a lot of good choices. And then right. you can't really choose to not have the choices. Can you? you can't choose to not have choices. Or to let choices cease. Maybe you can, but it seems to be. Right. Yeah, it is a subtle thing, but basically the idea is that by you know by by making those good choices, then you lead to the ending of uh, having to make any make any at all. Yeah. Is it the same as karma in this case? Pretty much, yeah. I think I think the difference really is that karma tends to be more used in an ethical context, so you should do de good and not do bad. Whereas sankara is tend to be used in a more philosophical, sorry, sankara is used in a more philosophical context, as to, or an existential context like this one. Yeah. Venerable. So um, there are two primary um, overall schema for understanding dependent origination. So one is the um, immediate moment model, which is most commonly known through the writings of Buddha Dasa, Ajahn Buddha Dasa. And the other is the three lifetime model, which is the one that we find from Buddha Gosa's commentaries. And there's a few other <coughs> permutations which different teachers have presented, right. but those are the two most common camps. Um, okay. Another viewpoint is that both perspectives are equally valid, uh, and that dependent origination uh, has scale invariance, but it can be seen at all time scales. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on these different ways of interpreting. Uh, the overall structure of dependent origination. Mm -hmm. Is it meant to be seen functioning in its full completeness in every instant? Or is it only meant to be seen over three lifetimes? Or is it something something else? What are your thoughts? 
Mm. Well, you've noticed that I, I've, I've, I've avoided talking about those things during the whole talk, right? <laughs> So yeah, um, I mean, when when kind of talking about these things, I prefer to. I mean, I've, I, like a lot of these things are kind of they're, they're such kind of well-worn debates. I sort of try to sort of avoid them when I can. Uh, so <laughs> you know, it's like when I when I talk about bikunis, I try to avoid talking about Mahapajapati and the Garudamas and things like that. So I just kind of try to, uh, you know, try to focus on talking about something I think will be useful and maybe show some kind of new perspective on things. Um, look, okay, so let me answer that by maybe explaining a little bit my, about my own personal evolution in Dhamma. I don't know, okay? A different way of putting it, right? So when I first encountered the Dhamma in Chiang Mai, right, I was a, uh, you know, just, uh, I said before, not all those who wander are lost, but some of those who wander are lost, and that was me. <laughs> um, and I ended up in Chiang Mai, and I didn't really know what I was doing, and I rocked up at this guest house called the Eagle House. And the guest house was, the Eagle House was distinguished by being the second cheapest guest house in the Lonely Planet Guide, and the cheapest one was all full. So that's how I ended up at the Eagle House. Stayed there for a few weeks and I heard, made friends with the owners there, Pon and Annette. And shout out to Pon and Annette if you're listening. And if anybody's traveling up to Chiang Mai, <laughs> Eagle House is endorsed by Bande Sajado, so please go along. <laughs> and <laughs> we don't get sponsorship money from them, it's okay. But uh, then you know, staying in the monastery there for a while, you know, obviously Buddhism is all around you, right? So you, you know, just take an interest in the things that's around you. And I, I came across a book by Ajahn Buddhadasa, the Handbook for Mankind, and that was actually the first Dhamma book that I ever read. Uh, and you know, uh, you know, it's kind of mind blowing, right? When you first encounter the Dhamma, I mean, the thing that really struck me the really kind of the idea that really hit me at that time was the idea of the arahant and the idea that you can actually have like enlightened beings like that it's possible for a human being to actually like like have let go of suffering and be enlightened and stuff and that there actually might be people like that walking around on this planet right and it's just i've just blew my mind i had, i was like so fascinated with this idea I never, I never thought about that before. You know, it was just humanity was just variations on mess. <laughs> so, you know, this is kind of fascinating. And, you know, he, in there, so for those of you who are perhaps not familiar, Ajahn Buddhadasa was a teacher. Do, do you guys know who Ajahn Buddhadasa is? No. Yes, no, some, yes, no, okay. So Ajahn Buddhadasa was a Thai teacher uh, in, in, in the m sort of middle of the 20th century. He passed away, I think, during the 1990s. Uh, and he was an extremely uh, talented, uh, intelligent, and uh, you know, great practitioner who joined the Sangha and sort of swiftly became quite disillusioned by the state of what Buddhism was at the moment, at that time. And one of the things, of course, which is very characteristic is basically everybody is interested in just doing, sort of making merit so they can go to heaven, all right? That's one of the kind of big things. Like one of the first things I learned about Thai Buddhism is like when you give the food to the monks that you give whatever you want to eat when you go to heaven, all right? So <laughs> you know, right? And so you give whatever you want to eat when you go to heaven, but in heaven there's like no cholesterol. <laughs> so just whatever you like, that's fine. So, uh, and so Ajahn Buddhadasa sort of started looking into things and he really studied very deeply the suttas and, you know, Pali, and he was, he was an incredible scholar actually and a lot of the scholarly work which he's, he did, um, you know, hasn't made its way into English, but he did a lot of, a lot of things and he was incredibly influential. 
but he was also very controversial and he was he was kind of known as a stirrer right i mean in the early 70s uh you know vietnam war is going on there's all these communist incursions in the the countryside and all of these kinds of things and then buddha dasa wrote writes a book saying basically buddhism and communism are pretty much you know of a lot in common and this was like really disturbing to people yeah and a lot of the people in the hierarchy and the sort of mainstream of Buddhism there hated Buddha Dasa, like with a passion. You know, he was sort of away down in the south, so he could sort of stay away from the politics in the capital. But he was a very controversial figure. And he had, um, you know, he, he strongly emphasized that through, through the teachings of the suttas and through meditation, through mindfulness, this idea that we should live and practice, apply the original teachings of the Buddha in a, in a practical way to realize the truth of what's going on in this life now. And that Dharma should not be uh, just about sort of offering something so you can make merit and then go to heaven. Yeah? And I think, you know, obviously that's something with, that's great. And I think something probably hopefully everyone here would agree with. Uh, uh, and along the way, you know, many of his books are really insightful and uh, really, you know, because especially because he wasn't really part of a, um, like, it's not like sort of part of a community of people who are discussing these things. He was really just an innovator and a pioneer in that, in that context. Um, and his monastery is still running today. He's passed away. But what's Suan Mok, if you're interested to go there and uh, you can do retreats there. One of the innovations he did, he had like regular retreats for, for Western students in English. Anyway, so because he wanted to de-emphasize this idea of make merit and go to heaven, then he reinterpreted dependent origination as applying to this life. So the traditional model, as General said, of dependent origination within the Theravadan tradition is that uh, ignorance and choices pertain to... See, this is why I didn't want to talk about it, because I don't want to spend my time talking about the commentarial model and then... And then it, yeah. Anyway, so the three lifetime model, and so the dependent origination is stretched over multiple lives, and he said, no, no, you can observe it and see it happening here and now. And so the model he had was not quite a instantaneous model. Actually, it was more like over even a few seconds or a few minutes, you can observe the process happening. Uh, as a distinct from Yanavira's model, which is a purely structural model, which is which are, it happens all at once. Yeah, so Nyanavira's and Buddha's models are conceptually quite different. Anyway, so this was this that was li like literally the first book that I read about Buddhism, and obviously it made a lot of sense to me because huh, it agreed with all the things that I believed already, right? It, I, I didn't have to believe in rebirth because Ajahn Buddha Dasa is he saying there's no such thing as rebirth? It wasn't entirely clear, and people have different perspectives, but some people think that that's what he was saying, right? It's a bit, you know, not, not necessarily entirely obvious. So anyway, I didn't believe in rebirth. So I'm like, hey, this is good. I was right all along. Yeah? And that's what the Buddha, was, the Buddha agrees with me. Excellent. Good on you, Buddha. You got it right. <laughs> and then I went and did this retreat. So I do this Vipassana retreat, like a month-long intensive retreat. It's great. It's very, you know, uh, <laughs> very intensive. And we didn't learn anything, like, like we didn't learn any teaching. No, it was great because we didn't learn anything, right? We, it was all just meditation and experience, no teachings. And then we get to the end of it, and, you know, having some chats and so on with the people there. And they were like, blah, 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 something, something, rebirth, right? And I'm like, but don't you know, like Buddha Dasa's show that there's no such thing as rebirth in Buddhism, right? Because I didn't know anything, right? And I thought I did because I'd read a book. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 you're talking about rebirth and stuff, but that's all old fashioned stuff, you know. Here, here you go, this is now, there's no such thing as rebirth now. So, how to, how to win friends and influence people by Bhante <laughs> Uh Anyway, so you, you realize, okay, look, there's, there's these different takes on it and so on. So, but, you know, I really, I really did think that that was what was taught in the suttas and things like that. And then sort of gradually began to read the suttas and, you know, learn things for myself and so on. And I encountered different teachers who teach, had different takes on it. And of course, it's not always obvious, like, what the suttas are saying, right? I mean, there's so many of them. 
there's bits and pieces of information in different places and you sort of you know you build up a pattern and an image for things how they work over many years and that's part of the joy of it right it's a, you, you, it's a learning process when I was a young monk at Wat Nanachat, there was a, this, this became then a big controversy right what happened was that uh, a, book, a monk in Thailand called pra Prayuto uh, wrote a book about dependent origination where he basically presented Buddha Dasa's idea and the traditional three lifetime idea and said that these are alternative ways of looking at it. Essentially, that's what he did. Uh, and Prayuto is or was the most respected scholar monk in sort of mainstream Buddhism in Thailand. For, for, so for him to be coming along and sort of trying to have a middle way with this kind of rebel Buddha Dasa was, you know, it's quite a statement that he was making. So a book, a copy of this book went, was sent to Ajahn Brahm's monastery. Ajahn Brahm then wrote this fiery rebuttal of it because it was translated by his friend, right? So an Australian monk, uh, uh, Australian ex-monk, uh, uh, whose monk's name was Puriso, his, his Aussie name was Bruce. <laughs> That's why it's called Puriso, because it sounded like Bruce. Puriso just, Puriso just means bloke, right? Ajahn bloke, right? So it's Ajahn <laughs> Bruce. So he, after he disrobed, he went to, to, to Bangkok and he was translating this Mark Payuta's works. So he sent it off a copy to Perth for some reason. Ajahn Brahm got hold of it and he's like, no, this is wrong for X, Y, Z reasons, right? Now this was like this was like a bomb going off in the sangha at the time, right? Because you don't like because number one, you don't like say that what a senior monk says is wrong, right? Especially one who's as senior as that. Yeah? I mean, remember this was a personal letter. He wasn't like publishing something or anything like that. He was like saying, "Look, you know, I don't really agree with him, and these are the reasons." You know, he's writing a letter to his friend, but of course, it didn't stay there. It got photocopied and spread around. <laughs> we all eagerly got it and read it and debated and so on. But it was also very controversial because Ajahn, the, the head, the Western monk who's the head of our order at that time, well, not really the head of our order, but nominally in England, was Ajahn Zemedo. And he teaches that one life interpretation as well. So this was sort of felt as being a direct criticism of what Ajahn Zemedo was saying, even though he wasn't sort of mentioned in the letter. So it was kind of very controversial. And Ajahn Brahm got a big dressing down for it. So those of you who think that the Bhikkhuni ordination was the first time that Ajahn Brahm got told off, no, 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 no. There's a whole history behind it, right? And you know, he's from his point of view, he's he's you know having a discussion about Dhamma, and we can we can have a disagreement and have a different interpretation of things. And so he he wrote this this article which which pointed out a bunch of things, some of them fairly obvious. So you know, we already saw in that definition like your question earlier this is why I didn't want to go in too much detail into your question because it's a, once you open the lid you just keep going right so in the basic definition of birth then Ajahn Buddha Dasa says birth means the rebirth of a sense of self in the present right but of course we saw that the definition of rebirth there doesn't say anything about that uh, similarly the sense of old age and death there's no sense that this is a psychological metaphor for these things but that it's actually talking about getting old and dying, right? And so on. So there are other, you know, textual points and reasons and so on to debate as well. Personally, I think that the, I think that, I, I, I think this definitely is concerned with like the process of rebirth and samsara and how that's being built up and how it fuels consciousness through that process. I definitely think that's the case. I think that the three lifetime model is a little bit kind of too reductive and sort of a bit, bit too, like it's not, it's not. There are, there are, there are reasons. There are reasons w for that model which you can find in the suttas, right? It can be supported to some degree in the suttas. It's not entirely incorrect at all, but I, I do feel it's like a little bit too sort of cut and dried for what the teaching is. I think, I think, I think it's actually more flexible and more nuanced. So this is one of the th reasons why, when I'm t trying to teach it today. I'm trying to teach it in a way which is like bringing in some of those more kind of nuances and flexible kind of things rather than ex presenting it according to just a very kind of cut and dried model, uh, which, you know, it's easy to find. If you're interested in these things, it's very easy to find these things. Like basically any traditional Theravadan book will give you the, the three lifetime dependent origination model uh, and plenty of books by Ajahn Buddha Dasa or by Ajahn Sumedho or somebody will explain the, the, the one lifetime. So these are easily available. 
And look, I, you know, it's a complicated thing. We're not necessarily going to resolve all of those issues, but there's a richness to it. Right? There's something. There's something which is provoking in the way that it's presented and the way that it's drawn out that actually invites a kind of inquiry and a richness of interpretation. I mean, another apart from the. Oh, Sorry, allow me to make just one or two more points. One point is that, that so far we've been really considering it solely from a Theravadan point of view, but of course that's one of the basic Buddhist teachings. It's, it's essentially identical in the Tibetan and Chinese points of tr traditions and so on as well. And I'm by no means very familiar with those and all the philosophical interpretations, but my understanding is that the, the basic outlines of the three lifetime teaching are also found within traditional Thai, Chinese and Tibetan Buddhism as well. Um, so it's not like a peculiarly Theravadan thing. I think if you look, I think the Dalai Lama has a book on dependent origination and he explains it and basically even like almost all the definitions of words and things is almost identical to the sort of Theravadan sort of explanation. Um, so uh, so that's, that's one thing. Oh, the other thing about interpretation, which is probably worth mentioning, which is, and again, I hinted at this earlier, which is that this 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 interpretation or this teaching uh, applies the the concept and the process of conditionality to uh, a particular context, right? Which is how suffering arises, and you know, with a special emphasis on how suffering arises for an individual, and how we can let go of that through our spiritual practice. Now that same principle can then be applied to say how suffering arises in society, right? And there are suttas that deal with that. It can it can be looked at in terms of natural phenomena, and I mentioned earlier like how climate change can arise, right? So there's an environmental dimension which again is explicitly mentioned in the suttas on many occasions. Uh, it can also be used like that what the the in a way the one lifetime idea is the idea that suffering is being originated through a process in the mind. So you could look at something like, say, the Madhupindika Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, where basically that's exactly what it's talking about. Yeah. So that same principle can be applied in multiple different contexts yeah, within the Dhamma and even outside of the Dhamma. So we can take the same idea and apply it. But that, but that doesn't mean it just is the same thing. Right? It means a similar principle applied in different contexts. Yeah. So the context matters is what I'm saying here. So. I just want to round out this by just throwing out to you one more principle, which hopefully, like if you believe that you have learned anything from today, I'm now going to say to you this. I believe that the Buddha didn't believe or teach in causality at all. And that there's actually no such thing as cause and effect. So I'll just leave that with you. <laughs> You're with me? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. See, now you're confused, aren't you? Yeah. You thought you knew something. Now you're confused. Uh, I, I, I won't go into this in too much detail, but just very, very briefly to see what, what I mean by this. Come back to the beginning. This being so, that is. From the arising of this, that arises. This not being so, that is not. From the ceasing of this, that ceases. Okay. Now let me give you a, a, a an example. All right. Now let me let me do let me give you a, an example on this table. Okay, I can use this. Okay. So here I have a ta I have a table with a glass on top of it. Now I get my finger and I can push the glass and my finger is causing the glass to move. Yeah? You can see that, right? Can't you? This is your experience. Your direct experience is that you can see my finger pushing this glass, causing this glass to move, right? Is that right? Yeah. yeah? What you don't know is that I'm very sneaky. And before the class, I made a secret hidden mechanism with all kinds of magnets underneath this thing. And that that's actually moving the glass. And that my finger just looks like it's moving the glass. How would you know the difference? You don't actually see cause at all. 
You see my finger moving and you see the glass moving. You don't see my finger causing the glass to move. You see this being so, that is. From the arising of this, that arises. You don't see cause, you see this happening and that happening and you infer cause. Mm. So understanding cause is something that we infer and we understand in our mind. It's not something that we observe in experience. Causes are hidden. Mm. <laughs> All right. So hopefully that has like extracted a little bit of knowledge from your brains. <laughs> Left you a little bit more uncertain than you were. Hopefully when you go home then you can all think to yourself, not all those who wander are lost, but I am. <laughs> and at least we can make a start to thinking that perhaps we can find our way towards truth. So sorry to say, we're going to have to wrap up today. And it has been an absolute pleasure to spend some time with you. And uh, I express my gratitude to the two venerables who've started the center and have made it possible for us all to do this. And what you've done is amazing. I think we all know that. And also to all of those who supported the center here and made this community happen. It's incredible. And uh, I hope, you know, they'll be going over to New Jersey sometime soon. And I'm sure it will flourish for many years to come in the future.